position. <laughs> but we move forward. Uh, let's uh, welcome Dr. Allison Cotton. Uh, she is presenting on behavioral management and black belt parenting. Dr. Cotton. I have to follow that. Okay. So, um, like I said at the round table today, I could talk for just days and days about these things because there are just so many nuances. Um, we're going to just, yeah, okay. There's the laser. All right. Got it. Okay. So I'm going to start with just a little bit about me. Um, I am a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I am board certified in adult psychiatry and then also child and adolescent psychiatry. Um, my major clinical interests include autism spectrum disorder and then anything neurodevelopmental, uh, especially ADHD. I found out rather late in my career that it seems I have an interest in ADHD because I have ADHD and finally admitted it about, uh, what, two years ago when the, I think, fifth psychiatrist that I worked with said, you know, maybe this is a thing. And so I finally was like, okay, maybe. Um, my other interests outside of clinical medicine are social determinants of health and integrating those into how we practice medicine, not just in psychiatry, but also all of medicine. Um, medical education, I love teaching and shaping uh, young students into being good doctors, and then also physician mental health, especially during the pandemic. And um, these are my babies. I had, to, I had to shamelessly put the picture in here. We've had those puppies for a couple of weeks, and that's their, their big brother being really sweet to them for just a very brief moment. So those are our new puppies. So when I talk about behavioral management, believe me when I say we have been very engaged in behavioral management of these baby puppies in our house. Um, how I got involved with the SABI2 associated syndrome and all of the work that you all are doing here is through Dr. Zarate. I trained at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, so that's where I did my residency and fellowship, and I had an opportunity to work with him in his clinic and also um, join in on the clinic that they had in 2017 in, um, in Little Rock at Arkansas Children's Hospital. So that is me. So today, um, I hope I will be able to get through all of this. Um, I want to review the results of the study that I did with our team and discuss findings that have come out after that. And then also we want to understand the driving forces behind decisions that we make as caregivers and parents and discuss developmental factors briefly that will contribute to behavioral challenges, outline common behavioral problems in uh, SATB2 associated syndrome, but also just in humans in general. Uh, I want to talk about the collaborative problem solving model and apply it directly to your situation. We're going to talk about mountains for a brief moment and then discuss how to approach the conversation about medications. So that's a lot and I'm, I'm really going to try to get through it all. So our research study that we did in, through the clinic that Dr. Zarate organized in Little Rock was published in 2018 and Basically, what we did was we looked at um, behavioral problems and sleep problems in SATB2 associated syndrome. I'm extraordinarily nervous, and so I had to write down notes about the results of my own study. So here we are. Um, so, one of the, so we have this little section about what this paper adds. This was really the first paper of its kind where we looked at behavioral problems in a systematic way. So basically what we found was, as you know, Emotional and behavioral problems occur in SABI2 associated syndrome. Um, peer problems, hyperactivity, low prosocial pro behavior are common. Low prosocial behavior just um, is sort of a fancy way of saying social anxiety and difficulty with social cues. Um, we used the strengths and difficulties questionnaire and a couple of different sleep studies, and what we found was behavioral difficulties. Are, fa are perceived as burdensome to over half of the parents who answered that questionnaire. So most of the parents found this really challenging. And I, I don't like the use of the word burdensome because a burden is, there's a very negative connotation to that word and nobody ever wants to describe their child as a burden. But 
difficult, challenging, troublesome. And then nearly half of the individuals that we looked at also had um, at least one sleep disorder. So what we saw was that the emotional problems um, that people were reporting tend to lead down a pathway toward anxiety and depression. The peer problems, the pro-social problems that we were looking at tend to lead down the pathway toward social anxiety. The hyperactivity and the, the conduct problems that we saw tend to lean towards um, externalizing behaviors, meaning your kids are acting out, they're throwing tantrums, they're displaying their anxiety or their emotions externally. And then we also saw some, some indications that, that these kids are at risk for internalizing behaviors. Anytime you have a child or a person who is, who is nonverbal, who has difficulty communicating their needs, um, you're going to want to be high, very vigilant for internalization of problems. All right. So just very quickly, um, I want to ask you, and you can just call out an answer, and I'll repeat it so that the people online can hear. What are your goals as a parent? Happy child. Say it again. Happy child. Happy child. Yes. Uh, relationships with your children. Relationships with your children. For your children. For your children. Keeping your child safe. Keeping your child safe. Showing them how to express their emotions. Functional adults. And what was I heard in the back? Independence with self-care. Self yes. So what are my goals as a child psychiatrist when you bring your kid to me? My goal as your child psychiatrist is to reduce your stress as the parent, as the caregiver. Um, and that's one of my top goals, because you can't take care of your child if you are not okay. And all of you know that. You have all felt that. Another goal that I have is to improve parent-child interactions. So your child is, you are the one who knows your child the best. You are the one who is going to be able to identify the precursors to a meltdown, the internalizing, the cues that show you that your child is internalizing anxiety or depression. And then last, but certainly not least, my goal is to increase the adaptive functioning of the child. So can your child dress himself? Can your child get through a half day at school without a meltdown? So my goal is to help you set goals with your child and with me as a team to create a functional adult, ultimately. And whatever that looks like for your child, it's going to be different for every kid. So whatever that looks like for your child, our job as a team is to define that together. So how the heck do we do that? So when, we treat, when I treat autism spectrum disorder, I always tell my trainees that if you've met one kid with autism, you've met one kid with autism. Autism is all, totally different. It's all over the spectrum. That's why we call it a spectrum. So I think that really applies to SAS as well. If you've met one child with SAS, you've met one child with SAS. So the, the importance of receiving individualized and unique care and attention is so huge. So this slide is big. It's a busy slide. We're going to go through it very quickly. This is the kind of thing that I would spend eight weeks with our child psychiatry fellows going through and learning and discussing in great detail. I'm going to spend about 60 seconds. But I want you all to understand or to have at least some exposure right now to normal development. So what does normal development look like? Because you have to understand the normal in order to determine where is your child. Because your 11-year-old is not necessarily going to be developmentally at an 11-year-old's place. They may be a, physically an 11-year-old. Emotionally, they may be a 5-year-old. Physically, there's, there's so much variation that it's important to understand the norms before you, can under, before you can figure out where your child is. So Erickson and Piaget are two of the theorists that I really like as far as um, 
development. Ericsson is really my favorite. Eric Ericsson, which I just love. Um, Piaget has some kind of weird stuff that goes with him, but there, there, is, there are very important core tenets. So when you look at Ericsson's developmental stages, it's all about social interactions, which is extremely important when you have a child who is nonverbal, who has limited verbal ability, or a child who has autism. So between zero and 18 months, your child is in, or a normal child would be in the trust versus mistrust stage. This is where your, the child is developing trust with the caregivers. Is this a safe person? Is my mom going to disappear and never come back? So they are developing that. All of you are so invested in your kids. And so this phase, a lot of parents will miss this phase, especially parents who work 80 hours a week or who, you know, go on a, a drug binge or whatever it is that they're doing. They will miss out on this, but your kids have not missed out on this for the most part. I think it's pretty safe to say. So then the next stage is autonomy versus shame and doubt. This is where between two and three years old, as a toddler, the child is developing a sense of personal control over his body, over his physical skills. So this is where we get into like potty training and kids get afraid to use the potty because it, the loud flush scares them or they're gonna poop and it's gonna hurt. So they get constipated and it's terrible. So this is where they're developing bodily control, bodily autonomy. And then in the preschool years, we get into initiative versus guilt. This is where they are asserting control over their physical environment, so over what's around them. And this leads them to a sense of purpose. So this is where they are venturing out. So they will start to maybe stray from you, and they will be looking back to see if you're still there, and they will start to interact with their environment and learn to manipulate things around them. So this can be dressing himself or herself. This can be feeding himself or herself. So these skills are extremely important to give your child a sense of excitement to get out into the world and try things. So then once your kid gets into school, we have this phase called industry versus inferiority. This is where social demands start to increase, social and cognitive demands. So you get into kindergarten, you get into first grade, all of a sudden you have to sit in a chair for 40 minutes. I can't sit in a chair for 40 minutes. It's not possible for me. A first grader who's neurotypical has a lot of trouble. Your children are going to have a lot of trouble. So this is where we start to see the, the underpinnings of things like social anxiety, because like I said earlier in the round table, kids are awful. They can be so cruel to each other. As adults, we're generally able to restrain ourselves from saying those, those horrible things that maybe we're thinking, but we're not gonna say them. Kids don't have that filter, so they are terribly cruel to each other and tease each other. We all went to middle school, we all remember it. Maybe some of us have blocked it out. But this is where you get the underpinnings of social anxiety. And then into the adolescent years, this is where we hit puberty, which is terrifying for any parent. Puberty is the physical, the hormonal changes, the social demands. All of a sudden, there's, there's an erection in a, in a teenage boy, and you're just like, I don't know what to do with this. Oh, my gosh. So this is where the child is starting to learn about the increasing social demands uh, on as far as romantic relationships and friendship and a shifting relationship with their parent. Because at early adolescence, kids are gonna start pushing the envelope. They're gonna start pushing boundaries to see what kind of independence they can gain. So this is increasing complexity. So obviously, learning how to share a toy is very different from learning how to engage in social interactions in the 11th grade. So as your child ages chronologically, it will be very important for you to remember that the chronological age is not necessarily going to meet the social developmental age. Um, we see this in kids who have ADHD. They're 12, especially ADHD boys. 
they're 12 years old, and so they should be acting like a 12-year-old, but emotionally and from, from that standpoint, they are not that mature yet. So it can cause problems, especially if a child looks, more, looks older, it can cause inappropriate social expectations to be put on that child. So then I want to kind of superimpose on top of this Piaget's cognitive development. So I find this all very interesting because it's all happening simultaneously and you, it's, it is just a constantly moving target. So there's, you can't say, all right, well, my kid's in this stage right now. Well, that's just not how it works. You have to identify what skills are there and what uh, you're doing to grow the skills that are lagging. So for Piaget, oh no, oh, that was a laser. Oh, sorry, whoever I just lasered. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so for Piaget, he has these cognitive stages. So between the ages of zero and two is the sensory motor stage. This is where your child is going to be exploring the world with his or her mouth. So anything is going to be put into their mouth. That's how they start. And this is where your kid is getting the, uh, starting to understand that this is my body and that is my mom's body, and that is a toy, and there are relationships there. So this is where they start to interact with the world, understanding themselves re with relation to things and other people. And then we get into the cognitive pre-operational stage. This is where you see pretend play, drawing, you'll see simple language, you'll see imitation, this is where if your kid does something, like it's always, you know, the child says a, a terrible cuss word and all the adults in the room start laughing. So your child is like, oh, that was funny. That's a good thing. So now they're going to do it again, right? So this is where kids start imitating behaviors that they see, get, po get positive reactions from people. Um, but in the pre-operational stage, they, they don't yet have the concept of conservation. Um, so the, the classic experiment here is where you have two glasses that are exactly the same with the same amount of water in them. And you ask the child, which glass has more water? Well, they have the same amount of water because they look like that. And then you get a real tall skinny glass, pour one of those glasses into the tall skinny glass. So now in the tall skinny glass, the water level is higher. So now that child in the pre-operational stage is going to tell you the tall skinny glass has more water. So that's the classic experiment that you can do with your child um, to, to think about that kind of cognitive development. And then we need to go into the concrete operational stage. By age seven, so by school age, they should be able to tell you that the two glasses have the same amount of water, even if the glasses are shaped differently. So that's when they get more concrete. They start to understand the, the concept of conservation and they start to work within schema. So they start to understand this is home and this is how things are at home. This is school and this is how things are at school. And then finally, in the adolescent years, we get into formal operations where kids are better able to abstract. They're, they're able to um, form hypotheses and test them kind of within their own constructs. So that's normal development. Um, Kids who have neurodevelopmental disorders are just delayed, and that's okay. They, most kids who have uh, non-severe neurodevelopmental disorders like ADHD can land in, in the, the formal operational stage or in, can progress through these developmental stages appropriately. Kids who have more severe develop, neurodevelopmental disorders are not necessarily going to progress fully. So they may stall in the concrete operational stage, or they may stall, they may not ever form the kind of abstract thinking that is required to form a true identity. And that's okay too. The most important thing is that you know where they are or that you have an understanding so that you can set appropriate expectations. For me to ask a seven-year-old to come sit through this lecture quietly is completely unrealistic. So I'm setting myself and the child up for failure if I put them in a chair right here and say, pay attention. So you wanna, you wanna be the adult who sets your child up for success. 
So no matter what, positive reinforcement is key. Um, one thing I said this morning is that punishment just doesn't work. Spanking your kid, and I gave the example of my husband, who by the time he was 12 was six foot six. So like spanking him is not really a thing anymore. Maybe when he was seven and he was really scared of getting a spanking, that's, that's fine. But punishment in the long term does not last, does not form the kind of relationship that you want. And the, the pediatricians will recommend completely against spanking um, for, for a whole number of reasons. I recommend against spanking because it just doesn't work. It raises your blood pressure. You have to deal with the guilt and the shame after you spank your kids, so just don't do it. Positive reinforcement is going to get you to shape the behaviors that you want. And I recommended this book at the round table, but there's a great book called Don't Shoot the Dog. Um, and again, you can find it online. It's a free PDF. It's a, it's a behavioral management book. It's not geared towards kids or towards anything like that. It just talks about positive reinforcement. So the second your child does something that you, you want to reinforce, that you want to see again, you're going to give a reward or give some sort of positive reinforcement. And then on the other side of it, we ignore the negative behaviors. <laughs> I know you're all sitting out there like, okay, great. I'm going to ignore the negative behaviors, uh, the, the tantrum that lasts for four hours, like at Starbucks. I'm just going to sit there and ignore that and read my book, right? Yes, you are. And if you can't ignore it, then you exit the situation. You change the scene. And this is exhausting. This is a process. This takes time, and, and it is a huge commitment on your end. And perfection is not expected. Perfect, what did, what did this guy say to me? Perfect is the enemy of done. So trying to be perfect is the enemy of getting things done that you're trying to achieve. So let's talk about common behavioral pro problems in savvy to associated syndrome. I don't think that anything on this slide is a surprise to you all. Sleep disturbances, feeding problems, mood dysregulation, hyperactivity, anxiety, depression, symptoms of autism, so sensory symptoms, whether the child is hypersensitive. So when you see your kid covering his ears because there's a siren outside, that's hypersensitivity. When you see um, your child needing to be hugged really tight. We talked a little bit earlier about brushing or um, wrapping your child in a tight blanket. When they need that extra sensory input, that's hyposensitivity. Many kids who have SAS are hyposensitive to pain stimuli. So what's gonna knock me on the floor and have me in tears may not even phase a child who has SAB2 associated syndrome. And so that's something that you have to take into consideration. Um, other symptoms associated with autism stemming. So that's like the hand flapping or rocking, or sometimes they'll rub themselves. So all of that is stemming, meaning they are stimulating themselves. So the movement of the rocking, the physical contact, that stimulation is helpful for them for self-soothing. You can also get stereotyped movements. Um, somebody was talking to me earlier about how her, her son is tapping and the speech therapist is really just not okay with that. Like, it's very distracting, it's very upsetting. Deal with it. <laughs> That's, I mean, these, these are things that we expect and so the, the stereotyped movements, meltdowns. We expect meltdowns. We expect social challenges. Um, and then the behavioral outbursts, whether it's related to autism or whether it's just related to not being able to communicate, behavioral outbursts can come from anxiety or fear, can come from pain, because though our children have a, a higher tolerance for pain, they can still feel pain. So if a person has pain and can't communicate that, that's going to lead to a behavioral outburst. Constipation. Has anybody ever had problems with constipation? Constipation is terrible. It makes people absolutely miserable. And if, if we don't 
no, if we don't have any way to communicate it, then there's no way to really tell what's going on. And then also sensory. Sensory issues can cause behavioral outbursts. So at Walmart, I don't know who here loves to go to Walmart. I do not because I get to Walmart and I get overstimulated with the beeping and the people and the sounds and the colors and the squeaky wheel on the cart. So imagine having a sensory processing problem, which may come with autism or may just stand on its own, and being in a situation like that where it's just like, I, I can't handle this. You're going to have a behavioral outburst. Um, so I, could, I really could spend you know, 10 hours talking about each of these very specific things, and I'm happy to answer questions about them uh, toward the end or through email. Um, but I want to get through the rest of the slides so I can talk to you about this behavioral model. Um, but these are, these are things that I deal with in my clinical practice all the time in neurotypical kids and neurodiverse kids. And so these are things that have behavioral management strategies that you as a parent can learn. So I want to talk to you about the collaborative problem solving model. This is kind of, this is kind of radical and can kind of put parents on edge. Um, because first of all, one of the tenets is there is no such thing as a bad kid. Bad kids are really kind of my favorite kind of kids because what they are is misunderstood. They're not bad, they're misunderstood. Um, and the premise is all kids want to do well all the time. All parents want to do well all the time. All people want to do well. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, gosh, I think I'm gonna be like real bad today. Nobody wakes up and says that. And then this last little bullet point, it is the responsibility of the adults in the room to guide kids to develop skills to succeed. So this is where parents are like, so you're telling me it's my fault. No, I would never do that. I would get run over in the street if I started saying that. But, you, but the adults who have the cognitive and the emotional development who have the ability to say, I'm gonna step outside of this situation and identify what skill is missing for success. Those are the people who can help the emotionally and cognitively less developed humans in their lives understand that there is a skill that we can actually build. It's very concrete um, to, to improve this behavior, to improve the situation. So the idea is kids do well if they can, not if they want to. In fact, most of my patients who have ADHD, who get Ds and Fs in school, those are the kids who are trying the hardest. They're trying harder than the smart kids in the classroom who get straight A's because they know they can do the work. They just can't get their paper turned in or they accidentally fall asleep and they show up late to their round table. So it can be a great sense of anxiety and frustration. And those are the kids who are working the hardest. And then parents will come to me and say, well, he just doesn't want to do his work. That is a horrible thing for that child to hear, hear because it's just not the case. Um, so just a disclaimer, I am not formally trained in collaborative problem solving. Um, I put the Think Kids, Rethinking Challenging Kids logo at the bottom of the screen. Stuart Avalon is a psychologist out of Harvard who has come up with this model. And um, he's absolutely wonderful and they, they do a lot of parent training courses. So I encourage you to look into this Think Kids um, facility that they have. So kids do well if they can, not if they want to. There's a great TED Talk. Um, you can watch it on YouTube. If you search on YouTube, Rethinking Challenging Kids, it'll pop up. And it's Stuart, J. Stuart Ablon. He is, um, again, a psychologist out of Harvard. And he's wonderful. So what are we going to help our kids do? We're going to help our kids develop skills. So kids with SAPB2 associated syndrome are at, all over the place when it comes to where they are developmentally. And so that's why I went through normal development, because you have to identify where your child is developmentally and what your child's strengths are. Is your child a visual learner? Does your child do well with 
auditory. Is your child nonverbal, but they respond really well to gestures and sign language? You have to identify your child's strengths in order to be able to get to these skills. So what are the core skills for success? What have you identified as parents that are core skills for your child's and your success? Trying again. Compliance. Com compliance. Compliance. Okay. What else? Survival. <laughs> resources. Oh my gosh! Access to resources. I live in Nevada. We have none. Friend of mine from Rhode Island said, "Oh, just send your patient to the autism center," and I was like, "Tee hee." <laughs> We don't have one of those. <laughs> so yes, having access to resources. What else? Picking your battles. Picking your battles. What was that? Emotional regulation. Emotional regulation, yes. So, frustration tolerance for you and your child. Because this is immensely frustrating when you have a child that is just not doing what you want them to do. So frustration tolerance for you, frustration tolerance for your child. Flexibility and, and, and adaptability. So one of the big things that we see in autism spectrum disorder and one of the big things that we see in SAS is transition difficulty or difficulty if the schedule changes. So if there is an expected schedule and we're gonna to go to the beach, but then it starts raining, so now we're not going to the beach, and it's an unexpected change, what does that lead to? Total meltdown sometimes. Total derailment. Um, so flexibility and, adapt and adaptivity, adaptability, and then also problem solving. So when you and I think about problem solving, we think of sitting down and making a list of pros and cons and coming up with some solutions and discussing it with a trusted partner and then choosing a solution. Your child may not be able to do that cognitively. It's probably not gonna happen. But at his or her developmental level, you can develop problem-solving skills. And there was a lot of talk earlier about using safe language like saying you're safe. So that person worked with her child to come up with a way to allay that child's fears in anxiety provoking situations. So now mom says you're safe, these are safe people. That's problem solving. So you're working with your child to do the problem solving. So going back, uh oh, going back to kids do well if they can. There, there are three plans that this collaborative problem solving model goes through. There's plan A, which is you enforce your will on your child. How often does that work? I would say maybe, I don't know, like 1% of the time, if that. Um, people try to enforce something on me, and I might throw a tantrum. I'm 40 years old. So plan A is you are forcing your child to do what you want them to do. Now, if your child is placing his hand on a burning stove, Plan A is what's happening, right? You are going to snatch your child's hand away, and if that causes a tantrum, so be it, because that's a safety issue. Plan B is where the collaborative problem solving comes in. That's where there's an issue, and you are going to work with your child. And this may not be a conversation. This may be you understanding that your child is giving you cues that he's about to have a meltdown or she's about to get really anxious, and so you are gonna identify the situation around you. What are the stimuli? What's going on? How can I modify this environment? And how can I encourage my child to use skills like taking a deep breath or using any kind of physical um, sensory input or changing the conversation as far as what the child is exposed to. So you are gonna work with your child's cues that he or she is giving you and also with all of the other input that you get to collaboratively with your child problem solve. Because your kid may not speak necessarily, but your kid is communicating. And outsiders may not be able to understand what your kid is communicating, but you certainly can. 
We know that when kids are developing speech, their parents can understand most of what they're saying way before outsiders can. So you know what your child uses to communicate. And then there's plan C, which is this is not a battle we're choosing today. And that's okay. There's a fear in parenting that if you give in, so your kid is whining and whining and whining and they want this toy and they want this toy and you are tired, you've worked seven days in a row and you're just done and so you're like, fine, I'm gonna buy you the toy. Fine, I give in. And so now you've reinforced that if they whine, they get the toy, right? It's okay. That is totally okay. You can't win every battle. So plan C, which happens frequently, is you just do what you need to do to make it stop. Because having a meltdown, you feeling frustrated, all of these things all at one time is not really going to make anybody happy. So if you start to see we're headed down the meltdown pathway and there's nothing I can do to derail this, then it's okay for you to say, I'm going to throw this battle. You win this time, kid. It's okay. Life is very long and your kid will still have all of the positive reinforcement for the good behaviors for next time and the time after that and the time after that. So the skills for success, frustration tolerance, flexibility and adaptability, and problem solving, these are all very teachable skills. There are concrete skills that you can teach a child at any developmental level, and it takes a village. So when you have all of the caregivers involved understanding that this is not about forcing this kid to sit at this dinner table because by God, we're winning this battle. It's about developing these skills. So even if you lose that battle, is there anything that you did in that moment to teach the child about frustration tolerance, to teach flexibility and adaptability, and to teach problem solving? Because if any of that was implemented during this battle that you just quote unquote lost, you didn't actually lose. You, you won that battle. And it takes everybody, it takes a village. So I have my shameless mountaineering analogy here. This is me a, a, a lifetime ago um, climbing a mountain. And I love being in the mountains because it is so humbling. And having a child with these kinds of issues is the same. It, is, it really puts you in your place sometimes, doesn't it? So these are my two of my favorite mountains. Does anybody know what these mountains are? The one on the left is in Africa. It's Kilimanjaro. And then this is Everest on the right. My husband is laughing because I talk about this all the time. Um, he and I are going to climb Kilimanjaro. He doesn't realize it yet, but it's really happening. <laughs> so the differences between these two mountains are vast. I'll never climb Mount Everest. You got to have oxygen and gear and you got to be in pristine physical shape. It is technical. I will climb Kilimanjaro because all you have to do is just walk up for a real long time. So when you start thinking about your tasks ahead of you in your life, you have a seven-year-old now and you're like, how am I going to create a functional adult? Oh my gosh, that is not a question for today. That is an Everest that you don't need to worry about. So go back to your Kilimanjaro and all you have to do is just put one foot in front of the other. You get to tomorrow, you get to the next day and eventually you summit that mountain. And every mountain is gonna have a different level of technical requirements. So getting your kid to poop in a toilet, that might be an Everest for you. For other people, it might be nothing. It just might happen. Getting your kid to sleep at night could be a Kilimanjaro. Slow and steady is going to win that race. So, th so when you're conceptualizing the tasks, the goals that you set for your child, are they developmentally appropriate? Are you putting your child on Everest when they need to be on the bunny slopes? I was going to say out at Lake Tahoe, but that's not where we are. Um, 
and on the bunny slopes in Colorado where it's like super easy and all they have to do is stand there. So you gotta put yourself and you gotta put your child on the right mountain. And you have to identify, is this an Everest? Is this a Kilimanjaro? Is this a, a, an easy jaunt down the street? Um, and when you can do that, you can sort of triage your problems and understand that some of these things may not be achievable and, so, and that's okay. You don't, have to, you don't have to achieve all the things. Some of them may be a Kilimanjaro where it's gonna be a lot of just walking, one step forward. And I love too that when you, when you climb really tall mountains, you climb up during the day, you climb really high, and then you go down to sleep at a lower elevation so that you don't suffocate essentially, so that you can acclimate to the altitude. So you climb high and you sleep low. You climb high and you sleep low. And that is how you achieve your goals. Two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. That one step back is part of the journey. Just like relapse is a part of addiction. It's part of it. You have to do it in order to progress. Because if you just climb, 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 you're gonna not be acclimated to the altitude and it's gonna wear you out. And you can't take care of your kid if you're too worn out. So I have three and a half minutes left. I might actually get through this whole thing. So when do you medicate your child? That's the big question. So remember those things that I'm thinking of when I am seeing you and your child in my office. I wanna reduce your stress. I wanna improve parent-child interactions. I want to increase the adaptive functioning of the child. If the child can't be at school because the behavioral meltdowns are so severe, your child is being taken away from the setting where they're going to be learning adaptive functioning skills. So that might be something where we would, con we would consider medications. Um, no parent wants to just throw a bunch of pills at their kid. So when we talk about that, we have a conversation that is long, that includes you being free to, answer, to ask and get answers to all of your questions, and it's a team effort, so it's a dialogue. It's not, I'm going to meet with you for five minutes, and oh, I'm going to throw this pill at your kid. I'll see you in a month. It is a team effort. I recommend that you see a child and adolescent psychiatrist, regardless of the age of your child. Um, we in our clinic in Reno see adults with neurodevelopmental disorders, and the reason is that child psychiatrists get specialized training in all of these developmental things that are at the core of how we identify treatment for your child. And it is your right to sit in that office for as long as you need to and ask all of your questions. So what are the side effects of this drug? What is the dosing range? And there was a study that came out, um, it was a case study that Dr. Zarate did with Dr. Kumar, a former, uh, my former training director, um, where a, a preschooler needed more than double the standard dose of trazodone to actually achieve effectiveness for sleep. So we know that there are metabolic differences in kids with SATB2 associated syndrome. Kids have wonky metabolism anyway. Their livers and kidneys are in hyperdrive. So their, their livers are actually more active than an adult liver. And so you have to understand that the dosing ranges may be different for your child. You wanna think about long-term effects. You wanna think about black box warnings because a nonverbal child cannot tell you if they're having thoughts of suicide. They can't express that. And so you need to be aware of all of the risks and then all of the benefits and alternatives of these medications. And then trying a medication does not mean that you're married to it. Sometimes the feeling is once we go down the medication road, we're on that road forever. We're stuck. And that's just not the case. Everything is temporary in child psychiatry until it's proven permanent. And as your child develops, so as we go from being four to eight to 12 to 20, they're going to change physiologically, developmentally. They're going to change and grow. They're going to grow skills. They're going to learn different interaction techniques. And so they may not have the same medication needs. Um, here is my slide with just uh, all the drugs. Um, we use 
lots of medications for lots of things in psychiatry. So stimulants for ADHD, like Adderall, Ritalin, Vyvanse, Concerta. We use alpha agonists like clonidine and guanfacine. We use antidepressants. One, one mom told me that she has a kid who's on fluvoxamine. But we've also got fluoxetine, Lexapro, and Zoloft. We use antipsychotics, which is a scary name for a drug class, because your kids aren't psychotic, right? Sometimes it might feel that way, but they're not. Um, but these medications can help immensely with behavioral outbursts, especially in the setting of autism and neurodevelopmental disorders. I even put benzodiazepines on here because while I'm never going to be in the emergency room and have an adult come in and say, Doc, I just need my Xanax, I'm never prescribing them that. But benzodiazepines do have a place um, in situations with your children um, when they are used carefully and artfully. Anti-epileptics, seizure disorders are common in kids who have neurodevelopmental disorders. So your kid may already be on Depakote or Lamictal or Tegretol or Topamax or Keppra. Anybody have a child on Keppra? Talk to me later. Neurologists love Keppra. I hope there are no neurologists in the room. They love Keppra because you don't have to draw blood levels. You just give them med and it treats the seizures. I hate Keppra because it makes kids grumpy. It makes them so irritable and angry. Uh, so that's a conversation that you need to be having. And then there's things like hydroxyzine and trazodone and propranolol. So there are all these different meds that we can use. Most of them are off-label. So that's why I say you need to be seeing a child psychiatrist who has expertise in this area um, so that they are aware that we are gonna be using these meds. And you may need to educate your child's doctor. And I'm sure you've all done this before. And I'm sure you've been met with a range of, oh, thank you so much for this information to uh, something less receptive. Because doctors have egos, it's how we get through medical school. And so when mom comes in and says, well, I've been on Medscape, it's like, oh my gosh. But you guys actually know so much. You are such a wealth of information. You are here at this conference. You're looking at these slides. You know what alkaline phosphatase is. I mean, who knows that? Not regular people. So it's important for you guys to understand that you are, you know your child the best and you need, you are okay asserting yourself. And then I just want to kind of wrap up by reminding you that parenting a neurotypical child is really hard. And parenting a child who has any kind of neurodiversity, especially when it's multiple, when it's multifactorial, is incredibly difficult. So all of these emotions, guilt, happiness, shame, humor, exhaustion, selfishness, sadness, regret, grief, that word should is on there twice accidentally, but I'm glad it is because that word should just needs to leave your vocabulary. There is no should. There is only what is. So a lot of people will say, I should have been able to handle this better. I shouldn't be mad at my child. I shouldn't wish for another life. I shouldn't want to run away. Those are shameful things for a parent to think or to fantasize about. Um, but you are not alone. That is completely normal to have those thoughts, to feel helpless, to feel fear. So as you are going through your, your life and doing these things that you're doing for your child and with your family, you're okay having all of these emotions. Like It is okay to just want to run away from it all. What, what you need to make sure you have is the support to help you not follow through on that emotional impulse. So having the support, having the, the people around you, and having a therapist, having a family therapist, having your own psychiatrist, all of those things can add to your support. And that is it. That's all I got. I mean, it's not all I got. That's all the time I got. So what questions can I answer?
Hello. Hello. Um, so my five-year-old, uh, we started her on fluoxetine last year um, for anxiety. And she started at about two milligrams. We're up to about 4.2 milligrams at this point. Um, but the issue we're running into is she's prescribed through her developmental pediatrician and they will not bump her med unless they see her in person. And I'm sure you're aware seeing specialists can take months. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're kind of at a point right now where her dosage is just not quite as effective as it could be. Mm -hmm. um, but her next appointment's not till September and they won't adjust her dosage. Um, I asked her pediatrician about a recommendation for a child psychiatrist because I was thinking I could get in faster there and get that managed, um, but was told, was basically laughed at and told um, with COVID, getting into a psychiatrist right now is practically impossible. Yeah. So is there anything we can do between these long spans between appointments to kind of like increase the efficacy or just keep it effective for a little longer? Well, no. Okay. That's the short answer. Um, pediatricians and even developmental pediatricians, when you start looking at really complex medical presentations and using psychiatric drugs, even what I would consider a fairly benign drug like fluoxetine, um, they get really freaked out. Wait till you start trying to ask a pediatrician to prescribe an antipsychotic. I mean, they, they get really freaked out. So if you can get on a waiting list to see a child psychiatrist, go ahead and do that. Um, a lot of times, if you develop a really strong relationship with the developmental pediatrician and you, are, you make sure they know that you are aware that, like, I know the risks, I know the possibilities, I will communicate effectively, can we please try to increase this dose very slowly? And as long as you don't start increasing the dose without communicating with them, because that really freaks them out. That freaks me out. When I come back and I'm like, you did what with your lamictal? Please, no, don't, no, 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 no. We communicate. So as long as you are building that relationship with a developmental pediatrician, they will be more likely to get on board with making changes over the phone. And they know, or they will know that you're a parent who's not just willy-nilly doing things on your own, that you are really collaborating as a team. So I think that is a really good way to help them feel more comfortable going ahead and increasing. And, and 10 milligrams of fluoxetine is a starting dose in a, in a five-year-old. So, so that's a very low dose yeah. still. Um, so that would be, but I, you know, as I said, get on a list, a waiting list okay. for a child psychiatrist because the time's gonna pass anyway right. and you may as well go ahead and be on a list. Thank you. I guess it's, it's, you know, when you asked the question on Kepra, that's when I uh, thought I'd ask, uh, this, this came to mind, right? So, um, like a lot of uh, SAS kids, right, my, my daughter has, she gets distracted easily. One of the things we were talking with our neurologist about this, and the, uh, the suggestion was maybe try an ADHD medication, which is kind of similar to Kepra, I mean, in terms of just the dosage itself, right? It's similar to Kepra in the sense it doesn't have a whole lot of side effects. You can easily take it out, take, take that away from her if that's needed. But Mike, the, the apprehension I have is she's not been diagnosed with ADHD as such, but you know, just to make sure she's focused in school and all of that, is that a good, good way to go or not, right? So how, I mean, is there a way that you can at least point us in the direction of how, how, how to think, about, think through this? So I love treating ADHD because it is, it is, you can be so artful and creative about it. It's all about the symptoms, when they're occurring, how severe they are, and you can tweak these ADHD medications just beautifully to find that sweet spot. So ADHD is a clinical diagnosis, meaning I can stand here and have a conversation with you and I can say, yes, you have ADHD or no, you don't. Sometimes I may want some more information. Sometimes I may want uh, to hear from other people. But to diagnose ADHD, clinical testing, so a lot of times people will tell you you need psychological testing, that's not actually required. And you will hear child psychiatrists rail against that all the time because there's so much untreated ADHD. So even if, she, if there's not a technical diagnosis of ADHD, 
Remember, we're looking at adaptive functioning. And, and this is, these are neurodiverse children. And so if adding a stimulant helps with that executive functioning, the impulse control, the decision making, the, the planning that goes with being in school, then, that, then so be it, that's okay. This is where we get into the insurance company question where the insurance company is not necessarily gonna want to pay for it without a diagnosis of ADHD. And in those situations, I will put a diagnosis of ADHD on the chart. It's, it's a hoop that we jump through, but my goal is always to get the kid the best quality of life that he or she can possibly have. And if that means I have to write down ADHD when maybe the kid only has eight of the nine criteria that are quote unquote required, I'm gonna do that. And that's the kind of flexibility and adaptability that even the clinicians you work with need to have. Because when, when the clinical picture is there, we, we are allowed to stray from our very rigid uh, diagnostic and statistical manual. Um, but treating ADHD can make a world of difference, even for anxiety, um, for depression, for sleep. You have to focus to be able to fall asleep, right? If your mind is just racing and going and going, you're not gonna be able to fall asleep. So treating ADHD with a stimulant can actually help with sleep, which makes no sense when you just say it like that, but that's very true. Any other questions? Okay, I think I went over time. Thank you, Dr. Cotton. Cotton, that was amazing. We appreciate you being here. Um, we're going to take a five-minute break while we queue up for Dr. Zarati and the end of our day. So um, we'll be at, back in a few.